So welcome back. So nice to see so many familiar faces and we have a lot of friends online as well. We're happy to have you. Um, for those who might be new, my name is Katie McKinney. I'm the founder and the head of school here at the Classical Academy de Lafayette. We are a classical private school here in Wentzville, Missouri, outside of St. Louis, and we teach kindergarten through ninth. Next year, we'll go through 10th, and we'll keep going until we get through to 12th grade, which is 2024, I believe. <clears throat> We're going to do something a little different tonight. We're going to try to open it up for questions for the people who are virtual. So you all can do it very easily by raising your hand. But for those who are on virtual, what I would like to do, this is very homemade, I'm sorry, but this is, this is the level of our tech at the moment. Um, if you want to send us a question, if you can send it to tdunn at calschool.org, um, that would be great. I'll hold that there for a minute. If you have any questions, send it to Tasha. She will then get it to us and we can incorporate it with Mr. Preston. He's going to try to repeat the questions for those who ask them here um, so that the ones online can hear it. Okay, so just a quick little intro and then we'll get going. Um, so back a little quick history on just sort of what we're doing and why. Back in 2010, my husband and I attended a history talk very similar to this one, and it was focused on our founding fathers and our American roots. It was kind of sobering after the fact because we started asking ourselves, why did we not know this? And were we the only ones? And as we asked questions, we realized we weren't the only ones. Um, so I had a mixture of public and private education as I grew. And so to, at best, I could say my education resembled the Roman ruins. I don't know if any of you would say that too, but it was a little bit of ancient history here and a little bit of Renaissance history there. But to say it was complete with a complete picture full of color, I wouldn't say that was true. Um, and today's education, generally speaking, modern education, um, doesn't cover the Western heritage. It doesn't cover the ancients the way it was done decades ago. And it's only been through our own personal pursuit of my husband's and mine that we have now begun filling in the details of our historical education through, we have a book club, we read lots of books, um, we take Hillsdale courses, um, we attend lectures like this one, and that continues to nurture our own um, cultural literacy and our historical understanding to bring that into clearer focus. So tonight we're gonna to continue that education. So you've joined our history event, our, our history series event with Mr. Preston. And tonight's talk is gonna be the second in a four part series discussing historical events and cultural ideologies. This program grew out of a consistent request, many of you've heard this, but from parents and adults desiring a very similar education to what their kids are getting right here at the Classical Academy. And after hearing about our curriculum, I just had, I've had a tour a day this week I have another one tomorrow. Um, parents are often saying, okay, great for my kids, but where do I sign up? I need this education as well. So specifically, this series is for you. Um, and we want you to have a sampling of what we're teaching in the classroom, <clears throat> but we call you our seasoned students. So we're gonna take a deeper dive for you all tonight. So on with our talk. We're gonna talk tonight about the Western civilization, its Judeo-Christian and Greco-Roman roots. We're going to explore how the past has helped shape modern civilization of the 21st century and how it may affect then the future of our civilization. And now about our speaker for any newcomers. Having always been interested in anything historical, Keith Pe Preston's passion for history of the Western civilization took a quantum leap when he went to a movie um, back as a high school student, and it was called Patton. Has anybody seen that movie? Okay, good. Um, not only was he interested in the story of the American military rebel um, who believed in reincarnation and would fight throughout the age, but Mr. Preston actually had a family connection as his mother casually knew Patton's son, which is fun, who was a classmate of a West Point friend, right? Boyfriend. Oh, boyfriend. Not okay. him. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so Patton's story then led Mr. Preston to researching his life um, of the general and giving then an oral report in his senior uh, in his senior history class or senior year, which then earned him the J.P. Walker Award in 1972. So for the last 30 years, Mr. Preston has been a frequent speaker on topics as wide ranging as how the Scots invented the modern world. Um, the Lives of American Heroes, such as John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, and a two-week seminar on understanding the Constitutional Convention and the Bill of Rights, or the creation of the Bill of Rights. So um, our, our students get to enjoy him every day, and I'm so thrilled you get to enjoy him a little bit tonight. So tonight's pondering of our Greco-Roman and Judeo-Christian roots and their blossoming into the Western civilization comes from an unlikely beginning 
as a freshman uh, history student at the University of Madison in Wisconsin, or University of Wisconsin, Madison. And it was a school his father used to refer to during the turbulent 1970s as the Midwest chapter of the Kremlin. <laughs> so after that blatant setup for next month's talk on the brief history of communism, we're gonna take a 60 minute look at a 5,000 year history of uh, culture with Mr. Preston. Thank you. It's going for you. You want to start talking and I'll... You want me to go ahead? Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna... I, I, don't, I don't know exactly we're, we're on. We are on. I'm just going to try to get it though yeah. here. Get this. Uh, it, you, you may notice, and, and I'm worried about this. It, it, you get ready to give a presentation. Or, okay, I just thought about when the last time we were in a family, which of course we were kind of the national <laughs> And um, please understand that I'm not being sacrilegious, and I have Moses holding two very different tablets from the ones we actually brought back in this time. Uh, but I saw someone do that when the iPad was working out. And I was thinking to myself how different things would have been had technology been different. But uh, if you time reflects the uh, technology and the motifs of its time, and so they were in stone as opposed to silicon. You're great. I'm just going to stay here for just sure. a quick second. It'll okay. disappear. And I don't think I'm going to be able to move forward there. Yes? No? Maybe? Or should I just. You might. Yeah, unfortunately, okay. I think it That's might fine. be. Can do that too. Okay. Yep. Got it. So anyway, the classical roots of Western civilization is the focus of our examination tonight. I, I had a little fun there. I said this is a very personal presentation. I don't know if any anyone here remembers the Kenneth Clark series. Oh, now it's working, and you don't press the button. Sorry, um, Helen. That's all right. There. Um, it, which he uh, introduced as a personal view. Uh, because of the BBC at the time, that, you know, want everyone to know that this is his view, it's not necessarily our view. So I, I put that there saying this is some thoughts I have, and not necessarily of uh, those of the classical academy. But anyway, um, so we're going to hopefully look at some of these influences uh, with a broad brush and uh, make a dialogue out of it, I hope, with uh, the questions that you're going to And in particular, this is the kind of subject that we could easily have full year courses on. I've got 15 minutes, okay. So we're going to touch on certain things and move with a broad brush. You need to talk as closely in here, in here. as a microphone. And then I need to be probably a little closer. That's here. perfect, great. Okay, yes. all right. So now the people at home have to see. Um, so I don't know, are there any hands here? Anybody remembers this series when we came out and said, yeah, we had to. We are up at the at college together and, and it was a course that they had there. Uh, Kenneth Clark's Civilization series uh, um, was during the uh, 1960s. And in particular, he was looking at Western civilization, although he didn't say it that now we would probably say the, the history of Western civilization. But I remember one thing very early on in the whole series that he said that always stuck with me. And it would be logical that you would ask this question first, which is, what is civilization? And Dr. Sir Clark's response was, I can't define it, but I think I can recognize when, when I see it and I'm looking at it now as he's standing in front of Notre Dame. And then we would see, uh, my recollection of the, the, the first couple of films was a lot of cathedrals, a lot of sculptures, a lot of Gregorian chants, and it all fit into the story as the, the, the first episode in particular, which was called The Skin of Our Teeth that Western civilization survived the loss of um, Roman civilization, the fall of Rome. And we'll talk about that a little bit when it moves east. And if it had not been for some monks and some monasteries copying down uh, famous books, if it had not been for a few people in the uh, Ireland Isles and other places uh, saving the technology, if you will, the thoughts, the thinking, of different philosophers, of literature, of drama, things that a lot of what we see today as Western civilization would have been lost um, in these early times of what people now call the dark ages. Um, but it was a time when there, there wasn't as much going on with Western civilization. So 
We owe, I believe, our Western civilization to the Greeks. It is the Greeks, the Romans falling after that, who further developed it. Um, and then there are the connections to the Judeo-Christian world that lead to what we think today about as our Western civilization. And what do we mean by that? We're talking about literature. And particularly drama is going to be something we're going to talk about in this presentation. Representative government. And I'm not just talking about uh, Athenian uh, democracy uh, attempts at uh, experimentation in representative government. You're going to see a Senate in Rome. You're going to see uh, on a very basic level of uh, people starting to have some say in their government as opposed to just government by you know, whoever happens to be the son of the king and then the son of the king and so on. So that comes from the experimentation that the Greeks are having. Science and its methods come from during this time. Uh, you have people talking about, give me a lever and a fulcrum and I can move the earth. Uh, that's quite a thing to think about for ancient civilizations, which do not have propulsion, do not have a, a lot of things that we take for granted today. Uh, but scientific methods come out of the Greek. History and its lessons, the writing down of history, the writing of events and interpreting those events. What does that event mean? How did it lead to where we are today? That is something the Greeks did. Early historians like Herodotus and Thucydides not only wrote about what they, they experienced or what they knew about, but started to take a look at it and say, what does it mean? How did we get here? What are the attitudes that caused these things to happen? Language and language is value and that words mean something and not just a way of communication but also explanation and teaching and education and speech and the tolerance of it. The Greeks were well known for this. There were things that in most societies of that time, if you said something that whoever was in charge did not like, the penalty was death. In Grecian times, particularly in the highest levels of Greek civilization, it was expected that you were to question things. You know, the thing that many of us heard in the 60s of question authority starts with the Greeks. Now, Socrates did have to drink a cup of hemlock because of that, but there's other things involved in it too. But the fact of the matter is, it was an expectation that you would question things, okay? And finally, valuing individual expression. And this is something which is very much a Western civilization tradition, the valuing of and the permission of the individual thought of each person and not just the group. And it is our erosion of this and moving towards the other that is most concerning about when you look at the current aspect of Western civilization and the changes that are attempting to be wrought. So much of our language and its meaning comes from the Greeks. And what do I mean by that? Well, you could go to something as simple as the word dinosaurs. And obviously the Greeks went around when the dinosaurs were, but dinosaur comes from the Greek, terrible lizard is the meaning of dinosaurs. And we don't even think about the fact that that, that basis comes from Greek. Finding someone's Achilles heel, coming from the Iliad, the story of Achilles, you look for that weakness in somebody. When somebody says that, you usually know what that means. How many people realize that that comes from this Greek story, this Greek tragedy? Yeah. Oh, I thought you were asking a question. Then. No, go, go. And at any time I invite a hand, so that's fine, especially if it's something that's unclear or something you want to correct. Go ahead. No, no you were just, okay, all right, that's fine. Sure, yeah, how many people, well, I would hope that a few, but it may be that it's less than it used to be. I mean, and this is the thing I have to watch these days. When I'm teaching middle schoolers, I have to think to myself, okay, what do they know? You know, they may not know Achilles heel, but they not, might know what the Spider-Man rules are, okay? So I, I keep that in mind and try to stay on top of those things. Um, being stoic about tough times, these are things that come from classical civilization. Is there something I need to be doing? Nope, just keep going. Okay. Um, hubris, pride before the fall. Um, that may or may not be, again, a word that people know. Is that helpful? Yep, that's good. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that, that this is something that we talk about as a society. You know, our, we, we used to, we used to certainly our sport legends, I remember growing up, uh, value humility. And, you know, taking one for the team or, you know, I'm, I'm here for the team. That may not be going on as much as it used to, at least not publicly. And so this is something else that we, that we get from the stories that the Greeks would tell and then the writings that we would see from the, And now I'm not able to. Yeah, I know. I just, <laughs> we're going back to what we were before. Okay. Sorry. That's right. 
if anybody wants to be an IT person for me, I would be <laughs> happy to do that. Sorry. Um, I apologize. Yeah. You might need to go out and come back in, and it's. I'm trying to make it good for the people on the. Oh, absolutely! Virtual. I understand that, and if it's good for them, then also it's good for our online people. I'm sure. You want to keep talking, or you want to? Uh, I'm right at this point in time. This is my notes. Okay. You want to go to the next slide? <laughs> yeah. Well, no. I want to. There you go. Sick of France. Comes from a great word. You know, we have some other words that we use for that, but people who um, will try to uh, curry favor, shall we say, in order to advance themselves. Uh, the Greeks noticed things like that and, and gave them words. You know, they, they put together words that, that referred to not just, again, not just communication, not just something that's going on, but the personal uh, attitudes. You're good. Keep going. I am? Mm -hmm. Oh. I'm down here. Yep, there we are. Okay, and so I just advance it from there, right? Yep, there you okay. go. Okay, yeah, got it. Um, the word planet itself means wandering. It was based on an observation. Hey, those stars are moving very different. They're kind of wandering through the skies. That's how they come past. And that those kinds of things stick. Um, it, it's all part of not just language, but attitude and analysis, uh, taking a look at uh, activity that's going on and saying that needs to have a precise word which describes what's going on. And I can tell them what's going on with this, so don't worry about that. Yeah. So what else did they invent is, is the, the, uh, the title of that slide up there. Okay? Go ahead. All right. I'm trying to get that far gone right, for you. Don't worry about that right now. I think we're okay, because I can okay. see it and I'll tell them what okay. it is. Okay, all right. <laughs> Social commentary. Much of the drama of the time was social commentary. What's going on in society? How are people behaving? Human thinking, human thought, interaction, society, as I said before, questioning authority. An excellent view of this is the fact that, that uh, one of the most famous plays during that time was Liz Estrada, which gave a women's view thing. I don't know how many people know what, what Liz Estrada is about. Liz Estrada is a play that was written during the Peloponnesian War, which was a very long war, very destructive to both uh, Sparta and Athens. And so the women are tired of the war and they want it to end. I'm giving a real quick thumbnail of it. So they decide the only way to make sure the war ends is to deny the men their favors anymore. And eventually the war will stop. <laughs> now it's a comedy in the way that it's written. There's been a number of reinterpretations of it, but again, this is a very highly developed civilization with thoughts about how do we deal with these bigger questions? How do we impact the, the governments that are making decisions that affect our lives? In particular, you've got this, this male who wrote it, who says, I'm gonna write this play and the women are gonna be the ones who are gonna figure this out to force the men to do the right thing. And this is the best leverage that they have. On. And so Liz Estrada, have been uh, reworked a number of different times. And so it is, again, this is a civilization that's certainly ahead of what's going on in the rest of the world in Persia and other areas uh, in, in the Middle East. The debate about free versus slave, what that means. Greek is one of the few societies at the time where you could go from slave to becoming free. You could get your freedom and become um, a free man and become a citizen. Uh, we, we had our own troubles with that after the Civil War. So the Greeks were dealing with this before we had to. The idea of building a better mousetrap. You come up with a better idea, you should be able to be successful. You should not be locked into a specific lane all your life. The theme of Plato's Republic is about justice versus injustice and what that means and how to affect that. Those kind of dialogues are really important. And you could say, well, maybe certain other societies had done this at different times, but the Greeks really developed this. And a lot of this is all going on at the same time. We haven't got, well, they're really good at this area, but not so good at that. You know, well, we've got the, the, the Muslims are doing great with mathematics. Yeah, but what about these other areas here? So the Greeks have got a lot of this all going on at the same time. Now, one of the reasons Western civilization is spread so well at this time in in history is because of Alexander the Great. I like to refer to him as Alex Appleseed. Because by conquering 
much of the known world at that time. He spreads Hellenic civilization all over, even though he's a Macedonian, which certainly Athenians would not have considered them the same at all. But by his conquering the known world, he spreads Hellenism all across the world. So Greek language is going to get spread across the world. Greek attitudes, Greek thought is going to get spread across the world. And one of the things he does in particular, there's one city in Persia where a number of his generals are married in a mass marriage with local Persian women. And what that means is that you're going to have a permanent presence there. You're not just going to go through and conquer and then eventually those guys will die and the other guys will come in. Your children are now going to be a combination. And so to a great extent, you're going to see the known world, uh, even though Alexander lives a fairly short life, the, the legacy of uh, Hellenic civilization across the known world that time, and the result of, of policies such as this, are we call them Susa marriages, because Susa is where that, that first happened a large amount there. Uh, that lineage is going to go a long way. And what do I mean by that? We've all heard about Cleopatra. And Mark Anthony, how many people know that Cleopatra was Cleopatra the seventh? Of course you do. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that she was a long line of what was known as the Ptolemies. They are one of the, the generals that all got pieces of the empire when Alexander died and they stayed there for a long time and it was their dynasty. And so Cleopatra had Greek blood in her. And so it wasn't so outrageous that you had both Caesar and then eventually Mark Anthony in, not only interested in her romantically and in, in making and uniting there, but that is also closer in culture because hers is a Hellenicized version of Egypt when the, the Romans come through or are interested in there. And she's not Liz Taylor, okay? <laughs> she's a Ptolemy. She's Hellenic. Now, we don't know the racial makeup of her, which seems to be the biggest interest these days in trying to relook at some of these things, but we do know that her, her ancestry is Greek. And then there's a certain commonality between ancient Greece and ancient Rome. They share a lot of these things here. Gods, many of the Greek gods end up, the Romans go, oh, I like those gods, and we'll just kind of give them a Roman name and off you go. So very much the same way that we've seen happen in, uh, in other cultures over the last 50 to 70 years. I mean, you can go to, Mac I went to a, a McDonald's in Hong Kong. I went to a Kentucky Fried Chicken in China. You would find that you would find this cross uh, uh, grouping together of these two cultures of, of Greece. And then as Greece began to decline, Rome rises. And they will share certain amounts of art and architecture and language and government. Their interest in drama, literature, poetry, education, same kind of idealism. Not perfect matches, but, but the, the, there's going to eventually want to be a cross between the two. So you can look at certain things. I know many of you probably had art history in college and you saw, okay, we had to study the Corinthian columns and the Anna columns and all the different changes that went on when, when, these, these, uh, when Greece becomes part of the Roman Empire eventually. So there is a certain amount of commonality that goes in there. Now, do we acknowledge today the influence of Greece and Rome in our current society? I would argue that we currently have a celebrity, in, uh, you know, obsessed culture, which is our own version of a need for gods. And what do I mean by that? Don't you feel sometime with the young people that they feel like Hollywood is Mount Olympus and the gods are from there? Why would I say that? Why would Kim Kardashian West have 70 million followers on Twitter? What has she done? Besides a few things that we wouldn't talk about in Black Company, but I mean, I'm not saying this is a bad person. I'm just saying she's a celebrity for being a celebrity, okay? And we have a culture that is very much interested in whatever the celebrities have to say, whether they know anything about what they're talking about or not. That's very much like the Olympus gods. And I'm gonna take it a little further. Some of the most popular films with our young people over the last years are what they are calling the MCUs. Anybody know what the MCU stands for? Marvel Cinematic Universe. Not close enough for government work, as we say. Okay. These are guys from Mount Olympus. Some of them really are characters from Mount Olympus. But I mean, rich guy puts together, you know, an iron suit and does all sorts of things. 
nice young man gets bit by a spider and can do all sorts of things. And you may think, well, okay, that's movies and all that. Yeah, but this has an appeal to our young people in the way that that superpowers and, and uh, putting gods in human situations with these powers and saying they have the same families and everything. This is part of the culture. It's been part of human culture for many, many years. Now, um, the kids know what Spider-Man rules are. Does anybody here know what Spider-Man rules are? It's okay if you don't. That was with the really, really old Spider-Man old 25 years ago, which was when the boy uh, first got his powers before he became Spider-Man. His uncle figured it out. He says, be very careful. He says, with great power comes great responsibility. Kids get that. The culture. When, you talk, when I talk to the kids about Spider-Man rules, they, they, they understand what that means. With great power comes great responsibility. It's not something you can use without responsibility. That is the kind of thing you would have seen in a Greek play. That's the kind of thing you would have seen debated and discussed in Greek and Roman civilizations. And of course, many of us wish that when our child goes to buy their first car, that they understood Latin well enough to understand what caveat emptor means, which is the buyer beware. And having a caveat emptor is a discussion of millions of children. The buyer beware. Anyway, those things have worked their way into our culture. Now, let's take a look at the Judeo Christian. The Hebrew commandments meet the Gentile world, I titled this slide. And that is because when the Hebrew commandments were first put together, they were more than just laws. When you studied ancient civilizations, uh, when, when I was in school, we talked about the Code of Hammurabi. Some people may or may not be familiar with that. And a lot of it is, if you do this, this is the consequence. And we're going to try to make this even for everybody. And say, you know, I like you and you're a good person, but you did this and here's the consequence, okay? Things are going to change a little bit when we get the, 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 the Hebrew commandments. The laws of morality and human social order and interaction are part of what's going on here. It's not just a, you know, a problem and a consequence to it. What do I mean by that? Much of this is still part of U.S. law today. Thou shalt not bear false witness. We have a term for that in the U.S. law system. It's called perjury. And you can go to jail for perjury. Of course, you're more likely these days to probably get a big book deal, but the fact of the matter is you can go to jail for perjury, okay? And while it says that thou shalt not kill, some have interpreted to say thou shalt not murder. There's a difference between you have to fight war, you might be involved in killing, or somebody attacks you, you got to defend yourself. We, we have our own category for that, we call self-defense, but you're not supposed to murder. And the thing about this is it's supposed to apply for everybody. And much of the Old Testament has stories where this happens to people who normally might be exempt from this in normal law situations. These are all laws you ought to follow, except the king, of course, doesn't have to. Well, King David found out differently because he violated one of those. And, 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 and in the story, the loss of his son is to some extent because of the law that he violated. Out of the Ten Commandments. We'll talk about that more further when we go along here, okay? Sunday is still special even in an increasingly secular world because of the protection of the Sabbath, Sabbath, Saturday in uh, Hebrew religion, it's Sunday in the Christian religion, but there's still one day that's kind of protected and supposed to be culturally special. Try to go to a Chick-fil-A on a Sunday, you will not find it open. And don't go to the they still take this very seriously. So that was part of the commandment said about it. Uh, stealing. It used to be stealing was just a question of you stole, uh, you lose your hand. Um, you, you commit certain crimes, you lose a body part. Now it's just, you're not supposed to do this. And there is a reason for that because it's wrong. Or you can have something which is a loss of honor. You need to have some honor. The fact that you have part of commandments uh, condemning envy, coveting, is a big deal. Don't cover your neighbor's wife. Don't cover his, his possessions. This is... This is a morality thing. This is a, a, a thing, not just a good, bad, you know, you commit an offense type of thing. These are the things that we should avoid. Adultery in a world of primogeniture, inheritance, and monarchy is important. And so in order to make sure that, yes, that's my son, and I'm sure that that's my son, you should have prevention that. And also not to do wrong things to somebody else, which is why David got in trouble for taking Bathsheba because he had committed 
a crime. He had violated the commandments when he did that. So it, it, it's not just about right and wrong from the standpoint of committing a law infraction, but morality too. And that's going to have an impact eventually on the Gentile world. So the concept of law was a new concept for some societies, not for others, but the, to have moral laws too is an important step and is part of the American, um, uh, the, the Western society. And we talk about that sometimes. Well, I know this isn't wrong, but I think it's unethical. We hear people say that sometimes. It comes from our, our, our Judeo-Christian uh, background. And what is more than just do's and don'ts, there are some do's that we need to do, such as honoring our parents. And it's honoring our parents because we recognize they made sacrifices to raise us and they deserve that honor. You know, how many of us remember used to hear people say one time, you know, the term show respect for your elders uh, may be harder than it used to be. But at the same time, we see that come out once in a while. Children will have opportunities to say, gee, I wish you told me raising children was that hard. If I told you it was raising children was that hard, you wouldn't have had them either. I wouldn't have grandchildren, you know, they might say. But the fact of the matter is that that they see the respect that comes out of the work that's done to raise a family is a good thing for people to understand. And we, we, we see that in the, the Decalogue and we see that in the way Western civilization looks at family. Um, it, but it's not worship like it is in some cultures. There are cultures that have ancestor worship, okay? That worship is saved for the deity. Honor and respect is what we give to the ancestors in Western culture. And then, of course, then there's the monotheism versus polytheism. It's kind of a modern Western version of contract law. I mean, in the end, that's what the Ark of the Covenant, that's why it contained the tablets. There was a covenant. There, the covenant was a contract. And the contract was, I'll protect my people, and you will hold me as the only God. And when you violated that, you've broken the contract. And there are consequences for breaking the contract. So it's a two-way contract. There's one and only one deity. Now that's going to have an interesting change when Christianity comes into the picture, because what's going to happen with Christianity, uh, once you have uh, Jesus of Nazareth is gone, and now you have what's known as the apostles and the original disciples, then the job is to go out there and convert, uh, which is something you didn't see a lot of in, in the Hebrew time. But once you get to Christianity, then that's the job to go out and convert. And that's why I say, I said earlier uh, about the Ten Commandments uh, meet the Gentiles. Uh, that you, you begin to see now you've got a difference here that you want to convert people, and that means going out and talking to the Gentiles. And over time, conversion is going to allow for adaptation. Now, it, it's put us in some funny ways in history, ways to convert. Uh, you go to the Germanic tribes. And boy, we really like this. This evergreen tree that represents, uh, you know, that uh, eventually the snows will melt and we have spring again. Okay, that's a Christmas tree. You know, we're about to celebrate Easter. How many people will be, you know, taking eggs and hiding them and and uh, eating the ears off of chocolate bunnies and things like that? And most of us are aware of the fact that these were ways we were able to persuade certain Germanic tribes to kind of change their ways by adapting. Uh, there are uh, different rites of different times of the year, I say, trying to be careful talking about this particular subject, uh, but that westernizes them and eventually allows for an introduction of, of Christianity into those groups. And, and that's the next big step that happens in, in Western civilization. For the first 300 or so years, Christians are persecuted within the Roman Empire on and off at different times until an emperor named Constantine. And Constantine, people have kind of said, well, Constantine converted Christianity. It's a little, little more subtle than that. What he first did is he granted freedom of religion. The first thing he did was stop the punishing of people for different religions. And he did that for Jews in the empire as well. But eventually he is going to say, yes, Christianity is going to be a religion. And that's going to make some changes that are going to advance Western civilization again. This is not about religion. This is about what's going to happen in the culture because of this. And what happens at this point in time is that when he converts, and shortly after that, and the empire is beginning to collapse back onto itself, by now many of the leaders are made completely, almost completely, of the barbarian tribes, which we would say, but they're not. They're Germanic tribes, and by now they're somewhat Romanized, but they don't have the, the uh, fidelity 
to the Roman Empire that the previous you know, Romans from in Rome did. And so he's going to move the capital east to what will be Byzantium and eventually will be named after me, Constantinople. And, and that's when his conversion gets a little harder. In other words, another, another more lasting. And one of the reasons that happens is due to his mother, who is known as St. Helena. And it's St. Helena, Constantine's mother, who goes to the Holy Land and runs across uh, today's version of the three card Monty guys who say, yeah, 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 we got a piece of the true cross over here. Or, uh, hey, this is where, where uh, you know, the, uh, the ascension happened. All the, so all the places basically were places that were pointed out to St. Helen and said, this is where these different events should happen. And the importance of that is that it now gave a Western civilization focus to that area of the world. And you started seeing people come on pilgrimages to come to the Holy Land, to come to Jerusalem, to go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, to go to uh, the, the Mount, uh, Mount, uh, Mount of Olives and the different places there. That's a lot of that is the work of, of uh, Mount Helena. And she comes back with a number of different relics. And the reason that's going to happen is those relics are going to get spread throughout the Western world. And when you have a relic, somebody says, I got a real piece of the tunic or something that was set to cross or something like that, then you're going to build a church there. And that is going to lead the community to work together on a project of building something permanent out of stone and out of marble and all those different things. So this is where you see a big change going on in Western civilization there. And then Latin will become the language of the Christian church at the time. So most of the uh, documents which were in Greek were translated to Latin to be said in services there. That's going to have an influence on all the Greek, all the languages of Europe, which we refer to many times as the Romance languages, because they have Latin roots and so many parts. I took two years of Latin in high school for one reason. I thought it would help me in my verbal and my SAT. And I probably guessed a couple of things because of the Latin roots, but the fact of the matter is I also enjoyed it because I understood by hearing about it how the influence of the spread of Latin throughout all these areas and the culture that went with the language made a difference in Western civilization. Education is going to be more part of school, church activity, schooling that's going to go on. Yes, we're going to have schools set up in different places, and that's going to have an impact. Literacy is going to increase in some areas. People will be hired, will be taught these languages, and then, as I said at the beginning of the the presentation, they are going to be involved in copying down these books. And it's the copying down of the books of saving those things in the monastery that allows many of these uh, old Greek and Roman texts to survive, eventually be retranslated again into the vernacular during a time that we like to call the Renaissance. The Renaissance, the rebirth rediscovery of much of these different aspects of Greek and Roman culture, the digging up of the Laquan during the early 1500s, which had a huge impact on people like Michelangelo, who suddenly uh, see the way that the human body is portrayed and much of the work that, that's going to start going on at this point in time is going to explode in a lot of different areas, not just art, not just sculpture, uh, but in science, in medicine and literature, this whole rebirth, a lot of it's going to come because of a rediscovery, not only of these artifacts, but of some of these books. I'm going to find everything that I can. What can I find on the planet? What can I find on, on chemistry? What can I find on, on the water moves and things like that? And so that's going to start happening. Now, we know that Galileo and Copernicus and people like that had problems with certain authorities during the times when they're making the discoveries. But look, who won in the end. The scientific method will win out. And a lot of it comes out of things that they had first become interested in and had questions about because of things that they read about in ancient Greek texts that were being retranslated at the time. The advances that we see during the time in science and math and education all come because of the rediscovery of these ancient uh, Greco-Roman texts. And then finally, of course, Gutenberg's invention of the printing press is going to allow a wider spread dissemination of all this information. So next thing you know, you know, Kepler wants to know what Newton is doing. And different people are, are cross-pollinating their ideas and taking bits and pieces uh, and, and getting new ideas and making new discoveries and using the scientific method to advance things going forward. 
That's what Western culture is all about. Now, the question being asked today is, are we still civilized? Much of what we're seeing today is an assault on Western civilization. Much of what we're seeing today is that Western civilization is the problem. Western civilization has been all about money. Western civilization has been about oppression. Western civilization has been about racism. And I would say that it's more uh, of Western civilization is not about what you can't do, but what you can do. The empowerment of the individual has been so much of the core of what Western civilization is about. You can't just reframe the past to fit your judgment past by today's right side of history group. That's incorrect. What are we going to be judged about? I asked my, my kids in classes the other day, what are we going to be judged about? 50 years from now, 70 years from now, 100 years from now. What are we doing right now that we should have known a lot better? It's easy to sit here and judge Abraham Lincoln for not just immediately freeing all the slaves. What if he tried to do that in Kentucky and Missouri and Delaware and Maryland and all left the Union and the whole thing had fallen apart? You had to do what's possible at the time. And so, so much of what we're judging uh, Western civilization about is, is, is the problems that we've had. And we have problems because we're human beings and we don't always agree and we don't always get along. But we're trying to do our best to go forward and not just be stuck in a cycle of whatever is new is good and whatever is old is bad or flawed or maybe evil. We don't know. Let's take a look at it on the merits and let's also judge people by their times. Now, the fact remains today when we look at Western civilization is the world is actually becoming more Westernized. I went to China in uh, 2013, and I look around at China, and everywhere I drive around in China, there's a Kentucky Fried Chicken. It's the most popular Western restaurant, believe it or not, in China. We stayed in Marriott and we stayed in Hampton Inns and all sorts of Western places, and the people are addressing more. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that means everything, but they're learning English like crazy, and don't kid yourself, they're going to figure out some way to get around what we call the Great Firewall of China at some point in time, because they're hungry for information, as all human beings are, and they're becoming Westernized. What does that mean? That means freedom of thought. That means thinking for yourself. That means the right of the individual. Western society is about you achieve and you deserve to benefit from your work of your achievement. I don't know how many of you know the story, but there's a real interesting story behind the scenes going on right now. The largest company in China, most valuable country in China, Alibaba. Jack Ma, who is the founder of Alibaba, has been disappeared, back in the scene, disappeared. I don't know what's going on. But I don't get the sense that he's free right now. But you can't have that much available to you, and you can't keep people down forever. And these are Western values that are being advanced. Uh, when you see the people in Hong Kong willing to stand up to the Chinese police, it's because they, they want the West to see what's going on, and they want us to stand with them. They, they cherish Western value. They cherish their Chinese history in their nature, but they cherish also Western values of the individual. Yeah. Iran before the Islamic Revolution was the most European country in the Middle East. You see pictures of, of uh, University of Tehran in 1975, and you would see women in very nice dresses and, and kids walking around talking to each other and sharing music and all that sort of thing. What's going on there right now? Artificially being imposed on them by a tyrannical regime. And I don't know how long that's gonna last. I, I had hopes by now there would be uh, more, uh, more opportunities. Uh, it seems pretty clear that the, the, the voting in, uh, what was it, 2011 uh, was co-opted. Um, but at some point in time, the, the Persians are different. They're not Arabs, they're extremely educated, very proud of their history. And they are in many ways, they're Persians, but they're also Westernized. And so I, I, I just got to believe that at some point in time, that's going to change. I mean, I don't know about you guys. I didn't think the Berlin Wall was going to fall in my lifetime, but it did. And you just can't hold back freedom-loving people forever. And it's my hope that that's going to happen. And again, when I'm saying West, you know, people try to say, that's, you're being chauvinistic about that. No, what I'm talking about when I say that, I'm talking about the certain value systems that are applicable to all mankind. Now, some are more ready for it than others. 
know, some may say, well, you know, I don't want to lose all my family. I get that. Everybody gets that. But there's also still a desire to have more freedom. But I, I think the Chinese people know more about the 1989 attempts in Tiananmen than the government thinks they do. Because they're figuring out, they're very technologically savvy and they're figuring out how to use virtual private networks to get around the Great Firewall <coughs> channel. And the Chinese government is going to be in the whole time fighting with their own people, trying to figure a way to fool them. And, you know, one thing I, I somebody in uh, information technology told me, it says there's a hack for everything. So at some point in time, there's going to be a hack for the tyrannical regime in China. There's going to be a hack for the Islamic Republic in Iran. Uh, hopefully sooner or later. I, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Do you remember that example of the uh, young woman in, in uh, Korea? Walked out of Korea, uh, North Korea. With her mother, yeah. That's a really good example because she saw a Western film. It's a Western film. Um, Remember, it was Titanic. The Titanic. She, she watched Titanic and she saw that girl stand up to her mother and say, No, this is the guy I want to be with. And that was just such a foreign concept to her, it just completely blew her mind. She also saw that people can have their own favorite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's just information is, is tremendous. That Western civilization is, has always been at the core, been about sharing information. That that's a legacy of the Greeks, and that's I I, I have my own thoughts on, on North Korea. I I, I think uh, I think the chairman was ready to to do business, but I think the Chinese squashed. Uh, this guy in China is the worst guy just now. Okay, I'm getting into my opinion. I shouldn't get off base. But I, 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 this, this is, but it's not, it can't last forever. It never does. And again, perfect example. To how, and again, how many of us thought in our lifetime we see that Berlin Wall come down? I still remember the night that, that they, they danced on that wall. I just couldn't believe I was watching. Because we used to see people get shot trying to escape, right? Trying to go by the Berlin Wall. So some version of that eventually we'll have to give. So, yes. Okay. All right. I'll do the best I can to, to look at the owl. So, um, you achieve, you benefit. That's Western society. And, and that can only really succeed with the protection of individual rights, which is something that we've always stood on. The individual person has rights. So many societies have been all about, well, the individual has to give up the rights for the good of, of, of certain groups or the good of the whole. And, and we, we fight that. Americans, Americans in particular fight that. But Western civilization, now, are we having struggles with that? Sure, we are. But um, when you start to lose it, you begin to notice. And at some point in time, I believe that we will. I think it's in our, 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 our society's DNA. Anyway, we'll find out whether I'm right or not. Each individual in the United States has protections against our own government. That's what the Bill of Rights is. It's all banning of things that the government can't do to you, okay? It's not rights. That's why they said it's not rights given to you of government. It's rights given to you by the deity, they said, providence, and government cannot interfere with those rights. And, and people are, they start to speak up when they feel that that's going on. It's the way it was designed by the framers of the U.S. Constitution. The question is, do we still value that Western tradition? of individual rights. You go on our college campuses right now and you have questions. There are people that do not feel they can say what they think on college campuses. They feel they will be canceled, as we say. We cannot have speakers who talk about things like this. I feel our most important Latin phrase in our world is e pluribus unum, one out of many. That's how we became a nation, those 13 republics. And then we've added states since it also means we are one people. We are the American people. We're not red staters. We're not blue staters. We are not this race. We're not that ethnic group. We're not that religious group. We are Americans. We're even proud of that. Whenever someone's pushed on us hard, I still remember 9-11 and all the people flying American flags and nobody said, well, who are you going to vote for or what party are you on and what state are you living in? We were Americans. We don't remember that. It's when we really act our best. Today's cultural ideology wants us to reject us. It wants us to make many groups out of the one. And these groups are okay and these groups are not okay. And, and you know that there are good or bad groups and you're stuck in those. You may have nothing you can do about that. 
because of your gender or because of your national origin, what happens to be, or the guilt of your ancestors. Uh, as Sean Connery said in the, the, the uh, my, one of my favorite movies, The Untouchables, when told about, uh, you know, how do we get Al Capone? He says, what are you prepared to do about it, he says. And so we have to ask ourselves, what are we prepared to do about this? And one of the things is to refuse to tolerate the assault on free speech. Be willing to speak out. Well, I may make my friends angry. I said, well, I'm sorry if I, my friend uh, is angry at that, then you need to love and understand me as your friend because of who I am whether you agree with my viewpoint or not, speak out. There is no such thing as hate speech. I hear that term and my blood boils. There's no such thing as hate speech. There are certain things that are not protected. You can't threaten somebody. You can't threaten the president of the United States. You can't encourage people to commit violence. But the fact of the matter is that most speech in this country is constitutionally protected speech and for a reason. And we can't go around and start labeling things hate speech. And so the legacy of the Western civilization and the US constitution is to protect speech. Or you could start a classical academy like <laughs> some of us in this room have done. And that's the end of my presentation. And I will take questions. Yeah. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Right. There's no question. I mean, I can make the case for the mathematics of the Aztecs and the Mayans. I, I, I can make uh, the case for gunpowder and the Chinese, and I can talk about, you know, even uh, spaghetti is actually just pasta that the Italians got from the Chinese. Uh, but what I'm talking about is on the whole, all of these things again, and particularly the value systems. And one of the things I, I feel that makes Western civilization unique is the, is the valuing of and the protection of the rights of the individual. Almost none of those, those uh, societies that I talk about have is anywhere close to their basic core. Uh, That's why it's oh, named Alexandria. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes, I'm sorry. The question was was uh, um, uh, wasn't there, well about the library in Alexandria, the knowledge that had been taken by Egyptians, um, and that's why my response was along the lines of you could certainly make the case for lots of civilizations and the contribution they made. I think what makes Western civilization unique is, is this, this total package, and particularly the value of the individual. And I think that's why Western civilization is continuing to spread to other societies that have always resisted it. And one of the problems when you resist it is that those individuals are gonna want more say so in their life, which is why the Chinese wanna somehow have communism, but we wanna be able to make money with it at the same time, but we wanna continue to keep this clamp down on our people. And I don't know how long I'm gonna be able to do that, but with things like the internet these days and the availability, easy move of money, um, I, don't, I, I think it has a limited time, probably not in my lifetime, but I, like I said, I didn't know the wall was gonna fall. A lot would have to happen in order for me to change that big time. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try to sum this up and you, you tell me why I'm close. It basically asking about with what we're seeing in China, we're seeing in other individual areas. How do, how do I compare that to what we've been talking about here in all these different societies? Yeah, well, specifically with the example of you know, with, uh, with, uh, with, they started with economic reform. Right. Very similar circumstances. Yeah. Well, I want to still be in charge. Right, right, right. Well, I, the, I want to be more well off. Right. And tax more and keep my government charge, and it will eventually spiral out. So, so the question has to do with what sometimes economic reform comes first, and regimes think they can give economic form without giving political reform or individual freedom reform at the same time. And I think that's where the Chinese are right now. 
I think they feel that in the wake of Tiananmen, they make, kind of made an unspoken deal. You know, you won't try to uh, push against the power of the Chinese Communist Party in the way we run things. In exchange, we're going to make everyone much wealthier, and you're going to do well, particularly with uh, interaction and business with the West. And how am I doing here? Okay, just keep going. Okay, um, and, and I guess again, my response to that is, I, I just don't think it's something that that the more they embrace bits and pieces of Western thought, they're not going to be able to keep it down forever. Now, what does that mean? How long? Two generations, three generations, but at some point in time, there's going to be a generation that, that's going to come to power. And the old generation is going to, you know, all Maoists are gone. Deng Xiaoping came in and, and there was a certain amount of reform, but there was enough of them that said, no, we don't want to have political reform. And that's why Tiananmen Square happened. But at some point in time, a lot of those kids are going to the West for their education and they're going to get Westernized. It's just inevitable. I, I say that when people, uh, I've heard people say at times, it's, uh, it's weird to look around and see uh, people in, in Muslim garb or people in Hindu garb, whatever. I said, yeah, but two or three generations down the line, you look at America's history. They're going to be Americans. It's going to happen. They're going to be raised and go to a school where they're going to learn about freedom. They're going to learn about free speech. And they're going to want to take part of that. So, and, and because America is not about being a tribe, it's about thought. It's going to happen. So I, it, it may take a while, but I think eventually it, it's going to happen. People, people, people get economic freedom and they want the political freedom and, and, and individual freedom. That's my answer. And, and I'm, I'm guessing. I probably won't see it, but I'm, I'm just guessing. Do we have any questions from online? I'm sorry? <laughs> They're all sitting there in front of the computers. Uh, uh, I, I guess the, the net net of what I want to finish it with is, is that I know that Western civilization is under attack in many places and the scene is evil. This is the civilization that brought slavery to America. This is a civilization that you know, had the robber barons and that sort of thing. And I guess what I'm saying is, yes, they're full of flawed humans like most other places are. Why are people literally dying to get into this country? Is there any other country in the world where people are risking their lives, not to just escape from another place, but to get into this country? There's a reason for that. This country is made up of people from every nation on this earth, and they come to America because they know what we have here, even if sometimes we don't know, or we've forgotten, or we're not being taught. And this is one of the reasons I'm so happy to be here at the Classical Academy of Lafayette, to be supporting what's going on here, what Mrs. McKinney and the other teachers are doing here. And I thank you for your attention. I hope you can give us some support. We really appreciate that. Thanks very much. You have a question? I'm sorry. We have one more question. What is your thought on the in Oh, sure we will. Sure we will. We had a presidential election in the middle of a civil war, folks. President Lincoln was elected in the middle of a civil war at a time when he was, re they asked him not to stand for a nomination. He was going to lose. And McClellan was going to win. And he was going to sign a peace agreement with, with the South. And slavery probably would have stayed. But that didn't happen. But it did not look good that summer. People went, Republicans went to Lincoln to say, please step down. Don't run for re-election. Tell Grant you want him to run. He can get re-elected. You can't win re-election. And so we've seen much worse than that. Uh, you know, I, I remember talking to my mom about World War II. She, the first six months, she said there was no good news. No good news anywhere. Yeah, all these places were falling and Europe was falling and the Russians were getting crushed by Hitler and all these things. Well, if each one of us, it's up to each one of us, this is the wonderful thing about America, each one of us has the opportunity to go out and do something. Talk to your friends. Talk to your family. Don't let them shut you down when they, oh, I don't want to talk to you about you, You're this funny. No, no, no. I love this country. You love this country. We have that in common. Let's start there. Yes. Yeah. America 
the idea. Well, and that's what it is. It's an ideal. He's talking about America isn't perfect, never going to be perfect, never was perfect, but the idea is perfect. We, we set a very high bar. We had a bunch of guys, half of whom we know owned slaves and said all men are created equal. Okay, we knew that was an ideal. They thought slavery was going to die quickly, but that was an ideal, and that ideal is still there. And I'm doing what I can, helping out here at Classical Academy at the Lafayette. I believe in what they're doing here. I believe knowing more about your Western civilization roots and your children and grandchildren need to know the truth about what a wonderful country they've been born into. They need to understand that because they're not being taught that. They're being taught the opposite of that. So we have work to do. Uh, one person who I really love to follow says, right now we're in the middle of a war on reality, okay? And so it's up to us to help people remind them what reality is. And we can do that. We can do it. It's just different, different kind of war. We're not, we're not firing guns or we're not you know, uh, putting economic pressure on others. We, we have an information war going on right now. And, and it may be a long one, but our future is at stake and the future of our children and grandchildren. That's worth it. And again, that's why I love being here at Cal. So. Appreciate your. Oh, we got another question. Okay, go ahead. That's fine. As a parent here, um, I got here when I was six years old for our country and our world, and that's i don't know how many people on like it here but that, that's a great testimony about having having her children here and has made her feel like that's a being in a turnaround i'm going to end with something my wife and i have been once again what our 500th time watching band of brothers and which if you haven't seen it before you know if you can handle uh, some pretty tough battlefield and some swearing uh it's a true story of a company in world war ii and one of my favorite times is when they're going to be surrounded at Bastogne and they know there's going to be no help at all and somebody says you guys are going to be surrounded he says we're paratroopers we're supposed to be surrounded and the fact of the matter is we're Americans and we're supposed to fight for our country and we know that the most biggest fight of our country is is, is in thought and so each day just start out your day thinking rightly about your country loving your country what it is and and know that if people knew better they would think differently about their country and help them learn to re-love their country. Wow. Hard to even say anything after that, but thank you. That was wonderful. Um, there's just so many good things going through my head right now about just what we are doing here, and it's, I'm not even trying to plug the school, but I'm just giving gratitude. I do wanna say Mitch Clem is in the audience. He is our chairman um, of our board. So I should have introduced you at the beginning. I'm sorry I didn't. Um, and he's, he was here last, last time as well. But I think we've gained a new appreciation for this Western tradition, understanding the value of the individual, um, which we just had Rabbi, Rabbi uh, Landa um, as one of our virtue speakers, thanks to, to Jenna, um, who's one of our parents, and he spoke, he and I actually had a conversation and he spoke about that very thing, the, the, the valuing of that individual is key. And it, it's so wonderful to come together regardless of our races, our cultures, and we all agree on those universal principles. Um, and the fact that you achieve something, you should benefit from that. Um, and then of course, this freedom of thought, and that's what we're doing all over the place. And you mentioned um, e pluribus unum, just yesterday, I was subbing for one of our teachers and we were looking at money. And I looked, we looked at each piece of our coinage. And of course, uh, they all noticed, I said, what's the same about all of them? And they all noticed this Latin phrase. It was Riley's class. And so we were, we were enjoying, what does that, they'd say, well, I know it's Latin, but I don't know what it means. So we put it on the board and we talked for probably 10 minutes about what that meant. Um, so if you're in first, second or third or fourth, they should know what it means now. Um, anyway, we've had a great turnout. We've had about uh, almost 70 people online tonight, and we've had about 30 of you here. I'm so grateful for that. We've got two more sessions coming up. Um, and as Keith said, we, we do need your support. Um, 
I'm not going to be shy about asking for it because it's for a great purpose. We have 50, almost 55 kids here. We started with 26 in September. We've doubled, more than doubled. I do anticipate we have tremendous growth on the horizon. We have probably, I'm, I'm going to be conservative. I'm going to say we're going to hit 80 by fall. I think more than that, frankly, but I'll say conservatively 80. We are looking to expand to the back here. We're looking at portables. We're looking at what can we do to just keep this thing going? And so if you know someone who would be interested in helping us, we need help. We need support. But we are, we are moving in the right direction. And the more kids we can get in here, the better. Sorry. Thanks for coming. And thank you. Thank you.